brought to you by Best Movie Ratings. Best Movie Ratings is a one-stop, easy and elegant movie ratings experience. Stop wasting your time on bad movies and download the world's best movie ratings app from the iTunes App Store now. Hi everyone, this is Ahmed Kremli and welcome to Be Efficient TV. The mission of this web TV show is to boost the efficiency of your business and life through tips and tricks from leading experts. And today I have with me Mark Lassoff. He is a computer programming expert and he is the founder of uh, Learn to Program TV. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So why and when you started coding and programming? I started coding going back uh, about 1983, 1984. Um, I was 11 or 12 years old and my parents were very encouraging as far as getting me into the field of computers. So my parents bought me a Commodore 64 and I taught myself basic programming at age 11 or 12 basically because I wanted to make games. And I actually made a, a couple of games that uh, became hits in the neighborhood and my friends enjoyed playing them and, and just everything kind of started from there. I kept programming through high school and then college. So you didn't sell any game to like a big pro, like big gaming company, or you 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 didn't have that access, or you didn't know how to do it that time. Yeah, I, I didn't know how to do it, and, and I'm not sure at at that point my my games were quite good enough for anybody to buy. But uh, we traded them, you know, among friends in the neighborhood, and uh, they really uh, seemed to enjoy the games that I produced. What is your current focus in terms of business ventures? So currently, my primary focus is on learn to program. Um, our company is three years old, and we've grown significantly in those three years. Uh, we've grown just about 250 to 300 percent every year, and my full focus is on growing that to become the leading publisher of materials, content, and courses for people who are learning programming. So it's just focused on programming and coding. Right, we're just focused on programming and coding. We do have some courses and information related to that, you know, some design stuff, some user experience, but it's all focused on being able to create web, mobile, and uh, game applications. So how it works, like you have a membership or you just sell each course individually? We actually offer our students uh, a number of options. The first is a $39 monthly membership and that's a recurring membership which they can cancel any time but they have access to everything we do for that thirty nine dollars a month which includes our books some of which are bestsellers our uh, video courses we have about forty of those all geared towards learning new development skills um, live hangouts with the instructors but also you can buy courses or books individually for through amazon through udemy um, our courses are on Safari Technical Library and a number of other places. We really try and make our courses available where we think people would uh, benefit from them. So we're in a number of different course libraries. So you publish only your, the material that you produce or you have some other experts that put their books or materials there as well? Right. A number of the courses actually are my own. Um, as a computer programmer and an instructor over the years, I've developed a lot of material for the classroom that's been adopted for, adapted for online classes. But we have another number of other experts who have developed courses that we've published who are uh, leading experts in, in the field that they're in. We've had a lot of fun with those as well. We're always trying to get good experts from a number of different um, fields within programming to do courses with us. Our, our, our limitations are just kind of the size of our studios right now um, and, and then time in the week. But uh, we're looking to increase our library very rapidly. How often you publish like a new content? We publish new courses, which is premium content, um, once or twice a month. So we have a project management course that's just about done. We have a um, course on the famous JavaScript library. And then closely behind that, a new HTML5 with uh, for mobile development course, all kind of in various stages of completion. And then uh, after that, we're going to be tackling the new Android L. So we come out with about two of those a month, and then we come out with pre with uh, free content that goes on our Roku channel, on YouTube, um, and on iTunes, just about every day. So and. Uh and you give this for free, the other content, just you use it for SEO to, to, to drag traffic and then you have the premium courses, which is how long each course? 
or how many modules or it generally it's about 10 modules uh, anywhere between four hours and uh and, and eight hours for an individual course. We also have some um, course packages that can be up to 20 hours long where it's a number of courses kind of put together to help deliver a, a real specific skill set um, like advanced JavaScript or something along those lines. Um, so yeah, and the free content is done partially for SEO and, and partially to get our name out there and, and to build our YouTube channel. But also, our mission is about teaching people to program, and we realize not everybody worldwide has the means to spend $39 a month or $99 on a course. So we want to do uh, some content that's going to be available in places where people are impoverished that's still going to benefit them. Uh, which one is working uh, more for you, like selling the courses individually or the membership uh, concept? Uh, overwhelming majority of our income is from selling courses individually and part of that is time we've only had the membership for about six months and also that you know we've really taken a publishing model and tweaked it whereas you know our goal is to distribute through Udemy and Open Sesame and all these places that sell our courses and not do a whole lot of direct sales so it's kind of by design that it's ended up that way uh, before, like you founded this company in 2011, why did you do that? Why you decided to go TV and publish courses? And what, what is your background before that? Uh, I'm not sure I made a distinct decision to start this company. Um, I had been doing technical training on the road. Um, I had very, very good enterprise level clients. Um, I had been doing training at companies like Symantec and Aflac. Um, ADP, the big payroll company, for the federal government here in the U.S. and also internationally for uh, Motorola. Um, I had done courses for the government in Nigeria. So I was traveling constantly doing courses. It was very lucrative. I enjoyed it a whole lot. And sadly, I came down with colon cancer. Um, and that limited my travel. I did travel while I was under treatment. But as you go through chemotherapy, anyone who's been through it, knows that the effects are cumulative and as you get towards the end of treatment the effects are more magnified than at the beginning of treatment so as I had to kind of slow down which is not in my nature I was really bored at home while I was recovering so I decided I would put a course online on Udemy um, and to my surprise it was an intro to JavaScript course it sold several thousand dollars the first month without me really knowing how to promote it or to market it um, so from there I made another course and then you know the kind of beast I had created became too big for me to handle by myself so I hand I hired uh, who is now our VP of production Kevin Hernandez to help me and we started growing the company from there uh, you know we incorporated three years ago so that kind of is our official starting point but the antecedents of learn to program go back a couple of years before that how are you doing now are you cured I'm on the right side of the dirt, as they say. So yeah, I'm. Uh, there's no such thing as cured, but there's no evidence of disease in my body at this point. So uh, chances are, I will live out a uh, normal lifespan. Hopefully, thank you. Uh, hope like I wish you that uh, a life full of health and uh, happiness. Thank you. It's it's fortunately becoming a much more treatable disease but it's something that needs to be caught early so wherever you are I would encourage anyone over the age of 35 to go get a colonoscopy it's it's not a bad procedure it, it takes just a couple of hours and it can save your life and you think now it's this like incidents have changed your life completely to the to the positive things because it makes you discover your maybe purpose or things that you enjoy more and it's more leverageable than than the courses that you've been doing is that right well i'll, I'll tell you this i i after this i mean there have been changes most of which around the fact that i don't waste my time on projects people or um efforts that are fruitless frustrating um, aren't helpful to me or someone else. Um, I, you know, time is precious, so I, I don't want to waste any of it. And that's probably the biggest lesson is that, you know, it's okay to quit something if it's not working, um, and work on the things that really matter and impact, uh, you know, you and your family, and me and myself, your community, and, and, and the world at large. Um, and if you're not impacting others positively, you, you really need to look at what you're doing. 
you don't take uh, like any uh, external projects like web development or app development you don't like your team you're not focused on that at all no i mean and and that's not to say every entrepreneur should take that that uh, tack because you know projects can be a great source of funding as you're getting started but for us i didn't want to distract my team with projects that didn't bring us closer to our core goals and the ways we want to grow you know i mean yeah we have the skill sets to develop websites develop software and we get asked frequently but you know there's good clients and then there's you know clients that you probably believe it or not in the end cost you more than you make from them so we've been trying real uh real carefully to stick to our kind of focus which is on creating materials that once created have a unit cost of a sale of zero um have good shelf life and that are needed by people who are learning web mobile and game development um and just you know doing a one-off website for a client even if it's lucrative doesn't fit into our our larger uh, set of goals. Uh, in terms of marketing, which methods work for you the best in terms of like marketing for your courses? Is it like on your website or selling it on on the other platforms? And can so you just name few for us? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 hard to tell because you know one one of the weaknesses of the kind of analytics movement is that it fares fails to see the synergy of multiple marketing efforts done across different channels. So, you know, our YouTube channel, I think, drives our growth on Facebook, which drives our growth in website membership. So, you know, when you separate all everything down to an A-B test, you lose some of that big picture of the cross-channel um, growth that you have by being present everywhere. So our first thing we do is we try and be present on all the channels where our students are. So that includes, you know, maybe Pinterest, uh, Facebook, um, Open Sesame. So there's a number of channels where we try and be present, uh, Udemy being kind of the biggest channel that really drives our growth. Secondary to that, YouTube is our YouTube channel is is growing, and we put a, putting a lot of effort in remaking that um, into a channel that's a real driver of membership, um, not just a distribution point. So we're working so, actually with the people at YouTube who are nice enough to open their facilities to us and other channel partners. And second to that is Roku, which is an internet uh, you may not be familiar with as an internet television device, which is available in the U.S. and, and some countries in Europe that does similar to Apple TV, uh, gives internet-based TV channels. We produce our own internet-based TV channel through there, and that's also been a source of uh, pretty significant growth. For YouTube, you do free subscription, right? It's not like paid subscription. Yeah, we don't, we don't charge for anything on, on YouTube. And in fact, we're actually thinking of removing our, our advertising from it because we think the real benefit is in getting our content out there and proving uh, how good our content is and how easy it is to learn from versus the, the relatively small amount of advertising revenue that's driven through YouTube. Do you code now for fun for some projects, like just for yourself? I teach for fun. Um, I, I, the projects I do are mainly geared towards education to, and teaching. Um, so I created, you know, for example, an HTML5 game a couple months ago that's now used as a teaching project. I do teach for fun here in our community in Connecticut. I have a group called Biteray, um, which offers free computer programming lessons to anyone who wants to show up. So next week, we're going to start a six-week course on uh, gaming, in which we'll use Python to create arcade-style video games. And that's free to anyone who's a member of Bite Array here in uh, Connecticut who wants to come. So that's kind, of, that's kind of what I do for fun, in addition to a lot of volunteering in the entrepreneurial community. You never felt bored, like, over the years of changing the languages and learning more and more in new languages and, and codes? And it's, uh, tell us more about that. I think I'd be bored if it didn't change. Um, one of the exciting things about computer programming as a field is that you know it really is uh, a field in which you have to keep up with the latest changes because they happen so quickly and the changes are so numerous that you're really going to limit, if not end, your career by not keeping up. So I love learning new technologies. As soon as there's something new, I want to take it apart and, and see what's in it. You know, so we've been playing with the new Apple operating system here for the for the past few weeks. Now we're getting to the new Android operating system. I was always a kid, you know, if you gave me a toy, I'd take it apart to see how it works. 
And so that's why you know, learning the new technologies is exciting to me, but also learning them with an eye of uh, you know, strongly grounded fundamental skills that I picked up in college and over the years. And that's also really important is because I'm able to apply those fundamentals to uh, the new languages because you know what's old is new again um, you know there seems to be recurring themes in computer science that keep coming back and if you have strong fundamentals it makes the new stuff that much easier to learn let's d dig deeper into the programming and coding world like how can you tell us the history of they, how they invent like a new language or they why they don't use the same language to develop like more advanced programs and and they start writing different language that's going to work for different programs or to to create different more advanced games and how that works that's a really good question so years ago, programming was done directly against the computer's processor, where the processor was directly interpreting line by line each uh, instruction that you coded. Um, and that was known as assembly language or under that machine language. Um, we don't do that anymore. What's happened is that process has been abstracted by layers of code above it, where C, you've heard of the C programming language, or perhaps it's, it's, it's brother C++, um, lets you kind of compile directly to assembly language, we now have layers on top of that. And what we do is we continually build layers to make programming easier and more like the way you and I are speaking right now, where instructions are familiar. Programming is almost always done in the English language. Um, you know, so instructions are more and more like spoken English. So that's one reason. Two, different languages are optimized for different purposes. So for example, Languages like Python are really good at parsing good amount, large amounts of data and extracting information out of it. Um, that's so, great. So it means it's good for inventory so or for inventory systems or like commercial systems? Inventory, system. big data, you know, okay. getting information out of databases and drawing conclusions with huge amounts of data, that type of thing. Or you know, parsing a lot of information to just extract a small part of it. That's kind of what Python's optimized for, although it can be used for everything from video games to websites. You know, if you also look at other languages like .NET, well, .NET is really optimized for a Windows environment. It might be a good choice if you're going to be using Windows, where Java might not be such a good choice. So each language has strengths and weaknesses, and usually they're built to um, take advantage of the strengths of a specific environment. And oftentimes libraries are then built on top of those languages to make programming easier by taking tasks you do over and over again and using pre-written code for those. And that's why things change so often. Hardware changes, requirements change. If you look at the development of video games over the last 20 years, you know, video games that were kind of simple 8-bit games 20, 25 years ago are now movie-like. And the languages needed to keep up with that in order for us to be able to produce at the highest levels. But I mean, why they don't just advance the same language instead of like calling it different name? Because it looks like when they call it into different na name, it's totally different code and different language, yeah. right? Part of, part of that is, is just the nature of business and that companies are introducing competitive products or competitive languages and they don't have the rights to the older languages. So, you know, Java, for example, is really controlled by Oracle. So, you know, while if you're not from Oracle, you can build Java libraries, but you can't advance the Java core. So Oracle is going to advance the Java core according to its corporate needs and its corporate goals. You know, so you can't just go in and, and, and advance Java and come out with the next version unless you're with Oracle. And, you know, Java is really good for certain things and probably not the best choice for others. So part of it is just you know, kind of the nature of business. Different languages are owned or controlled by different companies. But then with the open source community, um, that you know, some of what you're saying can be true. The JavaScript language, which I keep saying is the most important language to know, um, has done a lot of that, where it only operated in the browser. What's the difference between open source and, and what we were talking about, just for the sure. audience to understand? Uh, open source languages are owned more or less by the community. They might be owned by a foundation, but they're not owned by a generally a for-profit entity. And programmers have access to the core of the code and are able to make changes or additions to it. So changes are often advanced by the community itself. Examples? Whereas, uh, JavaScript, 
Python, um, jQuery. Okay. Uh, now Action Script because Adobe is, has donated it. Um, so with proprietary languages like .NET or Java, they're controlled solely by the company that owns them, Microsoft or Oracle or whatever company owns and controls the language. I'm not labeling one good and one bad. It's a different kind of philosophy that arcs across the different types of languages. But how they protect it? Like if I find uh, kind of find a, found a way to develop this language that's owned by Microsoft, then I have to change a little bit in the code and then call it a different uh, language name? Well, I give it a different name? You don't, you don't have access to the core files to be able to do that. Okay. You only have access to the end result of those files, which is the language, which is how you come in and communicate with the .NET core. That's all proprietary and owned by Microsoft. So if you did that, one, you'd be breaking a number of international laws, and, and two, you know, Microsoft just doesn't allow it because this is their technology that they've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in developing in and they want the rights to. So to, to simplify it, like I understand somehow a little bit of WordPress. So uh, it's like they don't give you the access to the, to, the, to the language, to the text, and you have the access only to the visuals to play with it. Yeah, it's, and that's, that's kind of a good parallel. You know, okay. WordPress itself is open source, so a lot of people develop for WordPress. Um, you know, WordPress. I'm not sure how the ownership of WordPress works or how it's how it's licensed, but that's an, kind of an example of the open source world. And generally, these open source products are free. Um, the others generally not always come with a cost associated with them. But the thing about open source products is because the community is contributing to the overall core, you may find those advanced with the needs of technology, kind of like JavaScript has. So in this sea of different languages, as a like absolute new beginner, what should I learn from where to start? It depends on where you want to end up, what your goal is. Um, if you want to make websites, HTML is generally the starting place. It's kind of the language that underlies all of the content you see on a website. Uh, JavaScript would go along with that. If you want to make games, there's a number of good places you could start. C or Python, uh, even Java. If you want to make mobile apps, well, then it depends on do you want to make for Apple's iOS platform, for Android, for both. So there's different starting points depending on, on what your goal is. Regardless, I usually start our students in Python. Um, we have a course called Programming for Absolute Beginners. That's taught in Python, and it gives you exposure to the basics of programming, which generally are... Um, kind of common in all languages. So if you learn them in Python, you can apply that to other languages you need down the road. From your experience with teaching different coders or programmers, uh, how do you see the programs online comparing with the programs in the universities? And which one you recommend more and advise uh, more? Like if you are just starting now as a, as a mm -hmm. programmer, what you will do? It, it depends on your goals and, and your time and your own situation. Um, you know, a lot of people get into programming as kids and then study it in college and take the university path. And if you have time for that, that's great. Um, you know, university education with liberal arts underlying a technical education in computer programming is optimal. Um, not everybody has four years and here in the U.S. $150,000 to pursue that route. So if you don't, Plenty of people are self-taught or learn online and do just fine. That's generally a quicker um, path, but you have to be more self-motivated. You have to be more disciplined. It's a lot less expensive, um, and it can get you into the workforce quickly. But what you lose is that whole context that a college education gives you. So I'm not going to say one is better than the other. But the reality of the situation is, if you've already gone to college once or you're working and have a family, um, then it's difficult to go back to college and get a four-year degree. So we have people in our program who range from moms who you know work during the day and after their kids go to sleep take the courses online, to uh, you know gentlemen who've really have been in tech but their skills have atrophied and now they need to catch up to children actually who want to get ahead of the courses they can take in school by taking our courses. So it really ranges who's in online courses where university courses tend to be more, you know, kind of that younger demographic who's 
you know, before starting their career. So I wouldn't say one is better than the other, but it just depends on where you are and what stage in life and what your needs are and how you can best learn given your situation and resources. But do you think that companies still value more the certificate from the university or they just do tests for those code programmers and maybe they hire people who never been in the university? How do you see that? Both philosophies exist. Um, some of the best programmers I know are self-taught. Uh, some companies want to see a degree regardless. But there are so many opportunities now in science, technology, engineering, and mathematical professions that um, really we need everybody. And you know, not all programming requires a computer scientist. To develop a basic web page and code that is a less complex affair than, for example, coding you know drivers for peripherals that requires knowledge of the processor and and you know very very microcode and very very small amounts of memory that's a lot more specialized and requires a lot more skill so you have to remember I mean, there's kind of an array of jobs for an array of skill sets and where companies look down or might, some companies might look down on someone who is self-taught or doesn't have a degree or learned online a lot of the opportunities are in short-term contracts and in freelance work because we need those people too and in the, all the times I freelance no one asked if or where my degree was from um, it was much more important to you have the skills and when I was hiring programmers myself back in Austin Texas um, most recently for a company called Network Logistic in the, in the mid 2000s um, I didn't look at where someone had gone to school we provided a basic you know skills, skills assessment and either you had the skills and the experience or you didn't. And beyond that, if you had the skills and were qualified, we were going to hire you if you had a degree in English or no degree at all. How to become a certified web developer? So in our program, there's two levels. At the basic level, there's three courses. Uh, then you study for an exam that's administered online. If you pass the exam, um, you become certified at the level one. Level two, there's four courses. You study those, go through the exercises, do all the labs, um, and again, study for a second exam. And that's really designed at that point. You're really at the entry level for a web development job. You know PHP, you know uh, service-oriented architecture, you know how to make HTML skeleton, the HTML skeleton, and JavaScript. It's, it's a good program, um, and it can take people you know, several months to get through everything and, and get certified. But we have had a number of students who've been certified and gone on to freelance or have gone on to actual jobs as web developers, some with municipalities, some with small companies. Is there is a way or method to like make your company accredited like a university or do you have that or like we're not we're not really looking for that um, you know certifications are really just that you know anybody can certify the employers anybody. like the, to see the paper but they don't look at the skills that much yeah. right you know so we when we certify someone we also arm them with some you know material about what the certification included um, you know what they learned etc so, so an employer has some idea what the certification is there is no nationally recognized certification in web development um, certifications tend to be proprietary and and sponsored by a company like there's a Microsoft series of certifications that frankly can be quite lucrative um, but they're not really web development certifications and they're keep you within that Microsoft ecosystem which is fine if that's what you want to do but also limiting in some ways you know, Cisco has a series of certifications on its hardware so you know when it comes to certifications I don't tell anybody our certification is world recognized and, and will you know kick open doors for you but what it does do is it proves that you know what you've learned you've passed an exam you've taken a uh, couple of courses that provide information about the languages you've completed lab exercises and the exam is kind of your proof that hey I took this I understand it and now I'm ready to work Okay, let's go deeper into the languages. Uh, what is H HTML and CSS and for what it's, it's used? Sure. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. It is the skeleton of anything that's delivered through a web browser. So it provides the for denoting the purpose of individual items of content. So if you have a picture, that's surrounded by an image tag. If you have text, we have paragraph tags, article tags, section tags, which are part of the HTML language. And the idea is you can take content 
denote the purpose of the individual content elements, and then use CSS, cascading style sheets, to style those elements for the particular screen environment in which your uh, code is going to be displayed. So you might have a set of CSS for mobile, you might have a CSS for laptop or desktop content, and another set of CSS for printing things out like a book. Um, so the CSS is like the concept or structure, and then you put, you fill in it, the HTMLs in different places based on the design or the structure that you have? The HTML provides the structure and the CSS provides the design and layout. Okay. What's the difference between HTML and HTML, let's say four or five? Not as much as people think. Uh, HTML5 is the next version of HTML. Most of HTML4 is completely valid in the HTML5 environment. HTML5 adds several things, including audio and video access, so you can directly put audio and video on a web page. It also includes a number of what are called APIs to access through JavaScript programming different aspects of the browser, such as geolocation, so the browser can tell where it is. So HTML5 is an advancement in HTML that allows for more powerful websites and mobile applications that are written in that language. How about PHP and MySQL? So PHP is a server language. So you have the browser in which the user is using to view a website, web application, or possibly a mobile app. But then you have the server that is sending the information through the internet to that user. So sometimes we have to write server-side code in PHP for more heavy lifting. For example, interacting in an e-commerce site with the inventory or on a travel site, looking up the availability on different flights. MySQL works with PHP as a database to store information in an organized way. Um, if you're not familiar with databases, think of it as a file drawer organized into different files and folders and then information in different rows and columns that you can look up. So you might use, for example, you might have a user fill in a form on a website. That form is designed in HTML with CSS and then when they click send, that information is processed on the server with PHP and then MySQL is used to store the data in a database. So PHP is like the connection between, let's say, the hosting and uh, the, the server and, and your website, and your website will include HTML, HTML and a CSS, and also PHP is like the method to uh, translate the language into the, the server, to talk to the server. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to think about it. And actually, mm -hmm. PHP, when it processes, actually uh, produces oftentimes HTML, that's displayed in the browser. So PHP might send you HTML back in order for that to be displayed in the browser. And MySQL is is uh, is like CMS but for the PHP? Like CMS for the HTML but it's MySQL for the PHP? My, MySQL is, first of all, MySQL is a database product. So it is a type of database, just like Microsoft makes a database product and Oracle makes a database product. MySQL is a database product that's actually owned by Oracle that's used to store data in an organized fashion. So it basically allows you to store rows and columns of data, but also allows you to create relationships between that data that can make the data um, a little more organized and, and easier to search and index. So those languages like used with WordPress, Joomla, and what else, and and with everything, or can you uh, can mean, you can you explain to yeah, us? I mean, those for languages are used with commercial sites like Facebook um, behind the scenes. You don't see that as a user because it's operating on their server. But Facebook, Amazon, all of them have some PHP and use a number of different types of databases. There's other options besides PHP, but that's a really common one, and that's why we teach it. There's loads of sites written in PHP, and we want our students to have the most opportunities, and, and right now that's with PHP. Although there's other languages that are important to learn as well. What is the Swift language? Swift is a new language from Apple, and it is designed to gradually replace Objective-C, which is the language that iOS apps are written in, iPad, iPhone. So Swift is a little bit of an easier language. Um, it is since the big like Since the beginning when they launched the first iPhone or I, like, you know, Apple Store or iPad, they've been mm -hmm. using this, the Swift or they... No, they've been using Objective-C. 
Okay. Swift is a new language that just came out in recent days that is, is used for this. So Swift is a replacement for Objective-C. So new developers would want to learn Swift because that's kind of the language of the future for iOS. Objective-C is what's been done in the past. Objective-C is a little more complicated and, and, and verbose than, than Swift. So it's Swift came with the iOS 8? Correct. Okay. And how difficult is it? Like it's easier than the, the previous one to make the job easier for the developers? You think like with the years, the languages is becoming easier for the developers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think Swift is easier. Um, Swift has a number of features that make it both powerful for experienced developers and easier for new developers. Um, I really like Swift. I, I actually, we finished our first Swift course here just a couple of weeks ago and uh, right now I have the top Swift book on Amazon called uh, Swift Language Fundamentals, the language of iOS development. So that's right now number one on Amazon in its category for mobile app development. And we've been really excited about the response, but it's, it's pretty easy to learn. The book's only about 250 pages. If you compare that to our PHP book, our PHP book's almost 600 pages. So we were able to explain everything in a lot less space with Swift and get people started more quickly. So how different Swift from the previous one in terms of percentage? 20%, 30%, advanced, different? That's a good question. Uh, maybe 30%, 30-40%. Um, it's, it's a different type of language um, that requires less code. It's a little cleaner. Um, and I think it's going to be more familiar to people who've used other languages like JavaScript or C++. It just looks and feels more familiar to most, to most developers who haven't had any exposure to Objective-C or having to do um, you know, a lot of individual memory management where they have to directly memory, manage the memory that's assigned to their program. Swift eliminates all that. That's all abstracted away. And I think that's one of the major reasons that it's easier to work with. You don't have to deal with the computer's memory. It's all automatic. How about AGAX, AJAX, AX, how you call it? AJAX, yeah. AJAX, okay. AJAX isn't a language. AJAX is a technique that's used to communicate with a server from a web browser without the user seeing a change to the page. So a good example, probably everyone at some point who's listening to this has uh, priced out airplane tickets or train tickets online or something like that. So when you do, you know, you choose a date and a time. Well, it used to be every time you changed one of those parameters that um, for, for your search, you'd have to go back and reload the whole page and display a whole new set of results. But now with Ajax, that communication is happening behind the scenes. So you can, for example, change, I don't want to fly in the morning, I want to fly in the afternoon, and make that change and get a new result set without the whole entire page having to be refreshed and redrawn. So okay. Ajax is the enabler of that technology, and it's something that's important for use for developers to understand. So it's also involved with the design and connected with the server as well at the same time. So how different is it from the PHP and MySQL in, in plain well, it's, English? It's, it's, in plain it's, English. All JavaScript. it's all yeah. JavaScript code. Okay. Um, so it serves a different purpose than PHP and MySQL, although it may communicate with PHP and MySQL. It's really an intermediate layer of code that's used for communication, um, where PHP and MySQL kind of stays behind the scenes on the server. How about C++ and C programming languages? Those are older languages that are still commonly used. Uh, C++ is a superset of C in that all of C is included in C++. And the places where it's most used are places where speed is really, really important. Earlier I talked about how the older languages were closer to the processor, there was less abstraction, and due to that, they're faster. So C++ you'd see in things like console video games um, or um, financial applications, trading applications where speed is required. So, you know, where you see C and C++ now is in a more specialized area where speed is really critical. So it's good for speed. Very good for and, speed. And you don't think it's not going to be vanishing with another one? For I don't specific think it's going to be completely vanishing. I think as time marches on, naturally there's going to be a tendency to move towards newer languages. 
but due to the amount of code that's already written in C++ that's out there, I think C++ programmers are going to be busy for a long time to come because all that code needs to be maintained and the process of replacing it is often too expensive to do. So it's going to be around for a while. How about Ruby? Ruby is, is one of the newer languages. Um, and with the Rails framework, it's been lauded as you know, game-changing for web development. So this is, I don't know Ruby myself. What I observe about Ruby is everyone who learns it and uses it really likes it. Um, it's however, used for what? It's got, I'm sorry? It's used for what? Web development, developing web applications. Okay. And everyone who uses it really likes it, but its use, I think, is not as um, pervasive as people think it is. So if you do a Ruby app, you may have, time, you may have difficulty finding developers to maintain it. And um, if you learn Ruby, you may find you actually have fewer opportunities than you thought you would because there aren't as many systems written in it. So is it replacing HTML? It's not going to replace HTML. It works with HTML. Yeah, I mean, it's equivalent it, to it. Oh. It's, it, it actually... It I actually mean, whatever you can build HTML, with HTML, yeah. you can build with Ruby like that? Because the browser only understands HTML and JavaScript. So those aren't going away anytime soon. What Ruby does, like PHP, is it provides a framework for producing HTML and JavaScript. Um, so it doesn't really replace it, but it uses it. And I know this is getting kind of in the weeds here, but yeah, it's it, they work together. Where, where Ruby would kind of replace um, a language, it would replace something like PHP or .NET. How about Node.js? Node.js is interesting. Um, it's another language I'm not that familiar with, but basically what it does is it takes JavaScript and it expands its utility to the server side and, and even to the desktop where you can run JavaScript programs in other environments than the browser. What is GitHub? GitHub. Okay. GitHub is a GitHub, yeah. code repository <laughs> that allows you to store and share your code socially. So if you're writing code and you want to share it even just among a team or you want to share it with the world at large, you can go to GitHub and store your code there. Also version your code so you can kind of roll back if you make a mistake. And it's a safe place to keep your code. So if your computer crashes, you still have all your code on GitHub. You can share it with your friends. Your friends or others can modify the code if they need to and create what's called a fork and kind of a new version of the code moving in a different direction. It's also a good way to organize projects that have a lot of developers working on them to make sure two people aren't working on the same thing at once, inadvertently creating two versions of the same uh, code block. Is Mac uh, code, like the programs programmed for Mac, is the same, like they, they used Ruby for it? Uh, Mac programs generally right now are being done in Objective-C or Swift. Mac is a closed environment, so you don't have a choice as far as what you use. You have to use the tools that Apple wants you to. And right now, the most common of those are the Objective-C and Swift. Okay, and the iOS is for uh, done by Ruby and, and Android by JavaScript? Ja okay, so Java is used for Android. Okay. Java and JavaScript are different. JavaScript is, runs in the browser. Java is a full programming language. Those are for Android. And then... So, so um, just hold on a second. JavaScript is for web development and Java for the apps for Android? Yep. Java is used for apps for Android. And JavaScript? JavaScript, JavaScript runs within a web browser. Okay. So there are different, different, different applications for the different languages. Is learning Photoshop is a must for any coder? No. Um, I, I'm about as artistic as, as a piece of wood. Um, so a lot of teams have a designer who can handle the Photoshop duties. It's good to understand the basics of Photoshop. I recommend it for everyone because you kind of have to understand how pixels work on a screen. Um, so it's a good exercise and also being able to do some basic Photoshop is always beneficial. Um, it's not an absolute requirement for programmers, but it, you know, it's one of the many skills that's really good to know and handy to have as you become a developer. If you can, you take us through the timeline of the languages since the '80s till now. Which one is the most, let's say, the the important <sighs> ones, and you take us through it? Yeah. 
So if you go back to the 80s, C and C++ were dominant. Um, and it still and exists till now. They still exist, yeah. C was, C was created in the 70s and it's still used. Wow. So C and C++, as time went on, um, you saw some basic programming, which is beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code. That was common in a lot of the home computers. And then as the 90s developed, um, Pascal became uh, a language that was used frequently. Pascal has all but disappeared at this point and replaced by Java. And in about 1996, 97, with the web coming to be, then all sorts of web-based languages were inst instituted, like the HTML, the PHP, the JavaScript. So during that period, you saw a lot of new languages as people were trying to figure out how to best harness this technology. So Perl was a language from that era that was very common and is now really falling into disfavor. As the 2000s started, Microsoft got its act together with the .NET family of languages, which are geared specifically towards Windows, and those became very po common in business environments uh, alongside with Java. And now you're starting to see a move towards um, Ruby, Ruby on Rails, um, Swift, etc., and kind of languages becoming optimized for the environments in which they work. So languages that are used more with mobile, languages that are used more with the web. So you're starting to see specialization of languages more than ever before. And there's always new languages coming out. Google's Go language is, is, is coming out now. So there's always new ones coming up as well, some of which will be adopted and some of which will be failures. As time marches on, I expect much of the same. Some languages will stay with us for a long, long time. Some will become very popular very quickly and then disappear. And then we'll have new ones that will stay with us you know, for a long period as you know, systems are written in them. And you know, it's important to know about the growth of different languages. It's not necessarily the best language that grows and sticks around. It's often the best marketed language, which unfortunately isn't, it doesn't mean that it's, it's the best solution. What is ASP? ASP um, is a Microsoft technology designed to, similarly to PHP, to communicate uh, between the server and web pages. What is the difference between Joomla and WordPress? Both are content management systems. Uh, WordPress started as only a blogging platform and has now developed into a full-fledged content management system. Joomla has always been a content management system, a little not quite as popular as WordPress, but still popular. Both are modularized, where you can get different modules to do different things. For example, if you want a contact us page, there are modules that do that for you. And the idea is they let you create a basic uh, web application and change the content easily without being a programmer. Both are really good choices. Any other choices and which one you prefer the most? Uh, Drupal is another one, D-R-U-P-A-L. Drupal would be uh, the main competitor of uh, Joomla. They're very, very similar. They have many of the same functions. Um, I, I don't necessarily say one is better than the other. I'll tell you that we use WordPress. Um, we really enjoy it and we really like the number of uh, modules that are written for it. That can be really powerful for marketing or for uh, user management or all sorts of other functions. So we've really enjoyed using WordPress over the last three years. Which language you prefer from all the, the ones that you mentioned? I like Python. Which is, my which is used for what? Python is a general, it's, it's, it's one of the few kind of general purpose languages. It can be used with websites, it can be used to create games, but it's just really clear and really easy for beginners to wrap their mind around, which is why I like to use it. It's, it's real specialty is working with data and being able to parse data quickly, because it is a fairly fast language and, and kind of lean language. But right now, that's, that's my favorite. If you ask me again in six months, I may be on to something else. How difficult is to shift the code of, let's say, an iOS app to, to make it work on Mac? Um, I've never done it. I don't know. I've actually never done Mac programming. Um, but because the environment is common between iOS and Mac, I, it's, it's probably somewhat difficult, but not as difficult, for example, as going from iOS to Android, where the language is totally different. 
What what entrepreneurs you think you should they should learn to be able to control their developers? Especially now everything is going digital. All of them have developers and and they speak different languages and in terms of I mean coding coding languages and so what they should learn to be able at least to control those developers or they should just so, hire somebody. Yeah, now, now now you're getting into where my views are a little controversial. Um, I don't think a non-technical person is capable of doing a technical startup or technical entrepreneurship without a technical co-founder. Um, it just so rarely works because you have to understand the, the software development process, the programming process. One of the reasons I think the failure rate for new entrepreneurs is so high is people go into something that they're not qualified to do. You know, I was a programmer, so I started a startup that involved programming. Um, and teaching, and I had that background. You know, we had uh, we just had Startup Weekend in Hartford, and I was a, a mentor and coach for Startup Weekend, where people start a business in 54 hours. And you know, one of the things that was nice was like we had teachers starting educational startups, so they understood that space. You, know, you just because you have a dream and, and you think it could be a good idea, doesn't mean you have the background to do that or do it well. Choose a startup in your area of expertise. You know, if you know food, do a food startup. You know, if you know software, do a software startup. Or find a partner who knows the technical space. Working with programmers is difficult because they speak their own language. They have their own, literally, they have their own languages. They have their own techniques. And by personality, they tend not to be the easiest person to work with. So partner with someone who understands that world who can get the ideas implemented well. But how about the outsourcing world? Like now, I am not a. I've never been a coder. I don't know mm -hmm. code, but I develop many apps, many websites mm -hmm. through experimenting. Of course, with with the time, you can tell that this is a good, co uh, let's say, developer or no, maybe mm -hmm. from their previous work or ratings and mm -hmm. projects. But yeah. still, not necessarily they will be able to develop your own project. So you have to test with different ones till you execute it. But of course, it's a struggle somehow sometimes. It is, and you know, outsourcing is, is common all over the world. Um, you know, in the U.S., people commonly outsource to Eastern Europe, India, um, and, and now South America. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with it. And there's good programmers all over the world, and there are bad programmers all over the world. The problem is determining which one you have. Um, and many people go through, you know, one bad program with the outsourcing. They say outsourcing doesn't work. Well, that's not true, but outsourcing unlike having someone with you who's developing the software requires a lot more management a lot more care a lot more description to get what you want because you have you know sometimes not only a communication barrier but a cultural barrier that you're trying to overcome because you're often working with someone from a different culture that being said a lot of people make it work really really well and it's a good option for entrepreneurs who are getting started who don't have a lot of funds but you got to be careful lots of people get burned and i think you said it best you've got to experiment before committing and make sure you have a relationship with someone who you trust and i think also who you like working with this is going to be a close, long-term relationship, and if you don't like the person you're working with, um, it's going to be difficult. And you know, I've worked with uh, programmers from here in the United States, from uh, India, Pakistan, South Africa, the Philippines, and there's good and bad programmers everywhere. Um, you know, what you want to find is someone who understands the problem you're trying to solve, who's patient about gathering requirements, who asks really good questions about what they don't know, and doesn't make assumptions as far as what you're thinking, and asks the question instead of going ahead and doing something incorrect. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's tough to find the right person, but you know what? It's tough to find the right person if you're insourcing, too. Yeah, and sometimes you need to learn some stuff like to learn if you are developing an app for iOS, you learn that is something called out like the, the source code and mm -hmm. you, you protect it. You ask the developer in each stage to keep it with you in case that you run away. You have to protect mm -hmm. yourself so you can at least shift to another one with yeah. all along the way. GitHub uh, is actually great for working with, with outsourced programming teams. We talked about GitHub a few minutes ago. Um, this way you always have access to the latest version of the code that they're developing. But how about these platforms that sometimes you uh, you code on, 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 there is a platform called Platinum or something that you put on it the code and, and it's going to work for Android and iOS at the same mm -hmm. time? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of libraries like that. Um, I, I happen to actually be an expert in one called PhoneGap. Um, 
And what it is, it basically takes the process of web development and takes your web, web applications and makes them into mobile apps. The way it works is you create a generic HTML5 based application and then what PhoneGap does or Platinum or some of these other libraries is it wraps that application in a wrapper so it works on the individual phones. So it's essentially running your, in, your application inside a wrapper. The great part about it is it's not detectable to the user. The user doesn't know that the application wasn't built natively. And more and more, the app stores are becoming uh, more favorable towards these types of applications. It's actually the method I prefer of development because you can write your application once and then distribute to Android, to Amazon Kindle, to uh, iOS, both iPhone and iPad, and even some lesser known and lesser used environments like Google Chrome or Blackberry or something like that. So it's, it's, it really is a great way. Now there's limitations. Um, you can't do everything with it, but for most apps it's just fine. Yeah, they say that you are limited, you cannot develop the code more and you have problems and then you have to develop it again, something like that. Is that right? Right, and there's limitations as far as some of the hardware. So if, if you heard about Apple's announcement, one of the things they talked about was near-field communication for payment or yeah, the, Bluetooth. Yeah, okay. Those things are not accessible through those these libraries. So if you're doing something with near-field communication or Bluetooth or a number of other hardware elements, you've got to write native applications. All right. How is your experience with Amazon and how is the process of uh, cr content creation for, for your company works? Like, do you create the books first and then the tutorials or you create the tutorials and then do the books and transcribe it and how, how it works? Without giving away too much of our secret sauce, um, we have a great partnership with Amazon. We have very good friends at that company. And we have a process in which we create our content for maximum flexibility. We create content with the fact in mind that it's going to be distributed to multiple platforms and we optimize both our processes and the content itself for that. Um, our Swift book came out on the same day as our Swift course and optimally that's how we like to do it. It doesn't always work out that way because books require multiple rounds of editing and things like that. But we certainly try for it because that gives us the maximum splash in the market when new things come out. But, um, you know, our processes have been developed over three years of very hard work with a very dedicated team. We've got uh, now, I think, eight full-time employees uh, and about four or five part-time employees all on the team. And, you know, the growth has been stupendous. And the one thing I can say about the Learn to Program team is every one of them is dedicated to the goals of this company and they work really, really hard. And we've been developing the processes to optimize that work environment. So, you know, a problem we had today is we're shooting too much content and we don't have the studio space. So, you know, we were looking at how do we juggle the studio space we have to shoot all, this, all these different uh, lessons and courses that we want to shoot over the next couple of weeks. Do you use like Audible, ACX to post sometimes some, uh, you know? No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not even, I'm not even actually familiar with it. Okay, you think that uh, codes always needs to be written or like a video for the people to understand it more than going just audio, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Audio only it would be very, very difficult because coding is, you know, a process not just of watching it, watching it uh, be done. You know, you don't want to just watch it, but you also want the students to be following along, coding along as you're developing the code. That's a visual process. So, yeah, I think video is, is optimal. Um, the only thing we do audio, we have a news uh, cast that we do a couple of times a week called um, Dev. And like Dev podcast? Is both a video. It's called Dev, D-E-V. Yeah, but we like both podcast? audio and a video version. I mean, it's a podcast? It's, um, we don't use the word podcast just because we don't like it, but essentially that's what it is. But also it appears on our TV channel. Um, it appears on YouTube. Since we cast to a number of different um, venues, not just, you know, for example, iTunes, a podcast is kind of a limiting term. It is available as a podcast, but it's not strictly a podcast. It's it's a newscast available in audio and video across a number of different platforms, including Stitcher. What are the other projects or future projects that you're working on? <laughs> We're trying to expand our library of courses as always. We're always trying to get more courses that are more relevant, update courses we have. 
um, and produce new books for our user audience, which is always growing. Um, so just a hint at a future project, uh, we're going to be looking at creating a parallel source of courses and information that reaches outside programming and into more digital media. Uh, can you take us through your typical li like life and, and work day? <laughs> There's nothing typical about my life. I do um, 30 to 40 speaking appearances each year. I'm going to be speaking this week at Tech Week New York, which is a huge tech conference. Um, I'll also be appearing at Tech Week LA. So if I'm, if I'm traveling, it's whatever's on the agenda for, for that conference that I'm appearing at or um, the company that I'm visiting. So in the last you know, few months, I've been to San Francisco, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, London, all for conference appearances or meeting with companies or partners. If I'm here, typical day, um, I'm up about six o'clock in the office at seven, spend a couple hours going through email, communicating with partners, friends, um, our staff, We'll spend a number of hours each week doing actual content development. And then all the things that come to running a business, marketing, finance, accounting, staff supervision, um, really account for the balance of my time at the office. I spend a lot of time working with our employees, doing training so they're better at their jobs, more efficient, meeting with our vice president, Kevin, who runs the day-to-day -day operations, setting goals, making sure things run smoothly. Um, and then at night, I'm either teaching for free, volunteering with the entrepreneurial community, hosting events. Um, I, I am not married and don't have kids, so I spend a lot of my free time dedicated to the community and helping new entrepreneurs develop their companies. So I volunteer as a mentor and things like that. So my, my life is really rich, but all focused around uh, business and, and developing new businesses and, and having fun. And it's, it's, it's very satisfying to me. What are the habits that you're trying to develop to stay efficient? So one of them is to develop a schedule for myself um, on a daily basis. I have uh, and numerous things to do to accomplish on a daily basis. And I find if I schedule the time ahead of time, I get more done and I'm more productive. So that's the first thing is have a daily schedule. Two um, are personal fitness habits, which are my weakness. Um, exercise more, eat less. I'm working with a great uh, trainer and dietitian who actually is in our same office building, who's teaching me to eat better and it's giving me more energy. Um, and um, I lose that kind of lull in the afternoon where people get tired and it's hard to work. So, you know, fitness and, and, and energy are really important. And I, the third area I'm working is just personal organization skills. Um, I'm, I'm not known for the, the neatest office and having everything in an organized manner. So I'm trying to become more organized, which I think results in higher productivity. Who's your number one mentor? My number one mentor. Can I mention two? No problem. Mention three. <laughs> okay. So I worked for a great entrepreneur and great founder down in Austin named Pierre Kerbage. Um, Pierre started a company called Total Systems in Kansas City and Network Logistic in um, Austin and sold both of those and went on to become a VP for uh, one of the big um, manufacturers of like TVs and networking systems, um, LG. And so working for him, I learned a lot about how to run a business, um, how to use your own personal energy and magnetism to get employees on board, how to make good decisions, and also how to sell. You know, at, at, at the foundational level of every business is sales. And Pierre is the best salesman I've ever seen, and just uh, so intelligent and so fat and so caring. One of the things I loved about Pierre and, and still love about him is that he knows the name of every employee who's ever worked for him. And whether that employee was the vice president of his company, like I was, or pulling cable through ceiling tiles, making $9 an hour, Pierre treated them the same. And he was just as likely to go out to lunch with you know, his VPs as he was with 
you know, the kid who just graduated college and is in his first programming job. So just a very egalitarian, smart way of, of, of building companies. And he's built and sold too and, and, and is, is, is quite well off because of it. The second mentor is Michael Martino. Michael was a is an older guy, uh, is in his seventies now, and is a vice is an, excuse me is a professor at Austin Community College. And I took one of Mike's programming courses years and years ago, and he really we became friends. And he had a career previously at IBM, um, working with microcode in the years when computers had you know six K of memory or something like that, and worked on mainframes. And just the historical perspective from him, the idea of requirement gathering um, are all things that I learned from him and just in, in a way that's really, really um, been momentously impactful in my life. So both Mike and Pierre, I hope you see this, they've been great mentors to me and, and continue to act su as such. Um, from your perspective, uh, success and the most important factors for success in three words work work and work okay <laughs> um, you know it's about the work ideas everyone's got ideas some are good some are bad most are somewhere in between it's about the execution um, I'm not the smartest guy out there I'm, I'm definitely not the best looking but I'll outwork anybody and it's in that work and working smartly productively and efficiently that success happens you know you make your own luck you make your own success and that comes from hard work the harder you work the more likely you are to succeed no one's going to do it for you uh, top three apps that you use on your smartphone uh, Evernote is is definitely a, a number one uh, I, we're in the Google ecosystem so the Google Drive app would be number two use that a lot to look up documents from the office and uh, Skype for communication with partners, uh, staff, and friends. Top three favorite books? Uh, Lean Startup is one uh, I, I really, really like. Uh, there's one, I forget the author, called Traction, which is a really great business book. It talks about getting traction. It's fairly new. And uh, no, no, number three is, is The Art of War. The top three people that you're inspired by? Wow. Top three people I'm inspired by. That's tough. I'm inspired by a lot of different people. So um, from, from the business world, I, I, I really, really um, enjoy Steve Blank. I find what he writes and, and what he talks about to, to be inspiring and, and drives me to move forward. Um, I'm going to say from a, um, from a from kind of a personal motivation world, um, uh, a great admirer of Martin Luther King, um, who's a civil rights pioneer here in the United States, who did incredible work in race relations, and also uh, from that same world, Buffy St. Marie, who fought for and continues to fight for the role of indigenous people in the United States to become an important part of politics in the world, and she does that and continues to do that through music. Do you listen to any music when you work? I do. Which one? Um, uh, it varies. Uh, most of the time I'm listening to uh, classic rock, although different times I can be listening to European pop or New Age. Um, the Cure, definitely a favorite. Um, Buffy St. Marie, who I mentioned in folk. Uh, Irish Celtic music sometimes. Just kind of depends what, what, what the work I'm doing calls for, but definitely some favorites like The Cure, Aria, Speedwagon, Journey, um, if I need to get pumped up. And then, you know, sometimes quieter folk music from, from some of the folk greats from kind of the American folk movement like Bob Dylan or Joan Baez. Do you follow any routine to sleep? Uh, I lay down and fall asleep. Yeah, I That's don't great. need one. I want to learn generally, that. Gen generally, by the end of the day, um, you know, I put, in a, I put in probably 12 hours at work maybe had dinner with friends or other entrepreneurs and then gone to some type of entrepreneurial event or meeting um i'm done i'm ready i'm ready to go to sleep till till the next morning what are the things that makes you really happy uh, my family 
spending time with uh, my mother and her husband Rick, my brother and his wife and his kids, and the great group of friends I've developed around entrepreneurship and business here in Connecticut. Uh, I spent all weekend, this past weekend, working at a startup weekend um, with great friends and inspirational people who are starting businesses, and that's really what gets me going. I, I was on my feet for 16 hours on Saturday and just happy as I could be. Um, and I think too, you know, just travel and, and the opportunity to meet really uh, interesting people all over the country and all over the world. Last question, how people can contact you? Uh, Mark at learntoprogram.tv. I That's check fun. my email pretty constantly and I try and respond to absolutely everybody. So Mark at learntoprogram.tv is the best way. On Twitter, it's at M Lassoff, at M L-A-S-S-O-F-F. Thank you so much for this interview, Mark. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, everyone. Be efficient and stay efficient and see you soon with another leading expert.